Microphone, brother. A few years ago, I would have tried to get that out of here, amen, without you knowing. <laughs> Isn't God good, amen? amen. Your pastor uh, grew up in Grafton, Ohio. I spent time in Grafton, Ohio, in the prison there back in 1970 71, pastor, amen. I don't know, what year were you born? Or maybe. Before I was saved, the year that Jesus was born. 1970, yeah. That's when I went in the first time, yeah. God's good, amen? amen? I tell you. Romans chapter 12 with me this evening. Romans chapter 12. I sure enjoyed the music, enjoyed those songs, amen? And uh, boy, I tell you, it excites me when I get to hear good music, good singing. Amen. And uh, and I, I, like, uh, I like preaching. I don't know, Pastor, I'm not the world's greatest preacher, and uh, but I enjoy preaching, amen? And I don't know what I would do. I don't know what I would do if I couldn't preach. To be honest with you, I really don't. Uh, I've been able to do a lot of things over the years, but I thank God for giving me the ability and calling me into the ministry uh, many years ago. And uh, I tell you, it's been a it's been a, a a run at it ever since. My wife Jenny, hold your hand way up in the air back there. She's way she's a back row Baptist tonight, amen. Way in the back, and uh, but um, uh, she's been with me. We've been married 45 years, and uh, then. Yeah, it's a long time. Wow, amen. <laughs> I don't know if he's saying that because I look old or because, no, I ain't going to say she looks old, amen. It gets me in trouble all the time, hallelujah. Here in Romans chapter 12, and I've been saved 45 years, so that's another story in itself, amen. But God is good. Romans chapter 12, very familiar portion of Scripture, I believe to you. If not, it probably ought to be, amen, but it's probably one of the Scriptures other than Maybe John 3.16 and Romans 2, uh, 8 and 9 and a few other scriptures that have been preached over and over and over again. I'm going to ask you to stand with me as we read. And I want to begin reading in verse 1 of chapter 12. Very poor, uh, poor of scripture, no doubt. You've looked at it many, many, many times. Uh, Pastor, I am not an expository preacher, although I have some messages like that. But not tonight, amen, I'm just saying. So we look here in chapter 12, verse 1, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and what perfect will of God. Now, Father, thank you, Lord, tonight. I pray that you would use this to... Speak to our hearts, Father. Speak to my heart, Lord. I, I've uh, been over these notes. I believe this is where you'd have me preach tonight, Father. Uh, help me as I, I come to this text, Lord. And, and then we look at some other things, Father. And then, uh, God, help us to receive your word tonight, Lord. I pray for those who are here, who are born-again believers, who are saved. I pray that you help them and strengthen them, Father, and guide them and lead them. And, Father, if there's anyone here tonight who is not sure of their eternal life, who's never been saved, Father, or they have a question about it, he'd help them to get that settled this evening. In Jesus' precious name, amen. You may be seated. As I begin tonight, I want to preach a sermon to you that I've simply entitled this, Evidence of Salvation. Evidence of Salvation. Now, he says here in the middle, beginning of this verse again, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. I'm glad he didn't say that I had to have somebody plunge a knife in my heart, Pastor, on an altar to be a sacrifice for him, but a living sacrifice, amen. My life ought to be one that's living for him and serving him and following him. He said, uh, and, uh, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. It's not hard to serve God, amen. It really is. It's just a matter of you decide you want to do it and follow him and obey him with your life. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. It begins renewing, begins at the moment of salvation. 
And the renewing continues on in your life as a child of God, as you study the Word of God, as you read the Word of God, as you learn the Word of God, as the Word of God is preached to you, as you read stuff about the Word of God, you continue to grow in the very grace of God. Amen? Amen. That's what the Bible does for you. That's what the Bible does for me. He says that we may prove it is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Well, evidence of salvation, I just want to use this verse here, or these verses, to be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the re Newing of your mind as a child of God. Evidence of salvation, number one, I believe you could, and there's many, you could, pastor, you could add to this, you could preach on this for a long time, amen? <laughs> Although I think you're an expository preacher probably, maybe, I don't know. But I'm just making a statement here that uh, number one tonight, if you're taking notes, write this thought down. Uh, evidence of salvation, I believe number one, is a changed life. A changed life. Now, some people might disagree with that, but I want to tell you what. When a person gets saved, there's something that comes different about them and something that immediately begins to change, something that you ought to be able to see or something they ought to be able to see about you as a child of God. Your life begins to change. And there's a lot of change in it. It's slow for some people. Amen. I don't know how it was for you. For me, there were some things that was slow when I got saved, Pastor, but other things immediately Change the filthy mouth went out the window, the drugs went, the alcohol went, the lifestyle went with it. Amen. There's things that ought to be gone out of your life when you get saved as a child of God. I get irritated by people who tell me that they're saved, but yet they're still living the same way that they've always lived, and there's never been a change in their life. That really bothers me. Really, I, it makes me question. Tell me, it doesn't make you question if they ever really knew Jesus Christ as Savior to start with. That makes me question their salvation, Pastor. And I don't want to question people's salvation. I don't want to go around saying, well, you're not saved because you do this, and you're saved because you do this. I don't want to do that, but you tell me that does not come to your mind many times, amen, when someone's not living the way they ought to be living and doing what they ought to be doing. A changed life. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, go there. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 with me. Look, at, look down with me, if you would, please, down to verse uh, 17 of 2 Corinthians in chapter 5. And the Bible says this, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is what? A new creature. Uh, old things are passed away, and behold, or behold, all things are become what? New. That means there's a difference. That means there's something that was old that's gone, and something new that has now taken its place. You ought to be different today than what you were yesterday, amen? And by the way, you should be different today than what you were the day that you got saved. If you've been saved 30 or 40 years, you ought to be a lot different today than what you were 30 or 40 years ago. There's something that takes place in the heart of an individual when they get saved that makes a difference. I'll tell you, when I, was, um, when I got saved in prison, and I'm not going to go into a lot of detail with that tonight, Pastor, but when I got saved, there was a fellow across the cell from mine, and a, there was about a 12-foot hallway, 15-foot hallway between us, two to, thick, uh, two to three inch thick steel doors, one man cell, one man cell. He got saved in Lucasville, Ohio, at the prison in Lucasville, Ohio, and uh, got transferred to where I was at. And uh, he, was, he, he was giving me the gospel of Christ. Now, I didn't get saved because of him, but when I got saved in that cell that night, the next morning I walked over and I knocked on his door. He said, who is it? I said, it's Mike. He said, come in. I opened up his cell door. He was, looked like death warmed over. He got the flu. He was sicker than a dog. And I said, Chuck, you'll never guess what happened. And he looks at me and he says, you got saved. And I'm thinking, I'm thinking, how? How does this work? Because two to three inch thick steel door, 15 foot of hallway, Two to three inch thick steel door. There's no way he heard me because I don't. I didn't pray like I preach. Amen. <laughs> and he said, "I can see it in your face." Yeah. He saw it. Ever. Listen, when a person gets saved, there's something different that takes place. Amen. amen. If you're saved by the grace of God, why don't you tell your face that it knows it? Amen. <laughs> tell you there's, there's something that happened in here that ought to be showing out here. Amen. In your life as a believer in Christ. Let, your, let, every, let, let people around you know what's going on, what has happened. Live your life according to the Word of God and not according to the flesh, according to the Word of God, not according to the will of man, according to the Word of God, not according to how you used to be, but according to how you're supposed to be now. 
There's a difference, amen. Colossians 3.10 says, And it put on the new man, which after what? Which after, a, excuse me, which is renewed after the knowledge, uh, after the image of him that created him. Uh, we need to put on the new man. They have put on the new man. Uh, there's something different. And putting on means it takes a little bit of work on your part. The Holy Spirit's doing his work. We need to obey him and do what he tells us to do. Right. And I'll tell you what, the Bible, does not the Bible say, work out your own salvation? Has nothing to do with getting saved. Has nothing to do with keeping saved. But has everything to do with how you live and behave after you're saved. Right. Well, there's a difference, amen, my friend. We need to be obedient to the very truth of the very Word of God. He says, Ye also, as lively stones, have built up a spiritual house and holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifice and accept them to God by Jesus Christ, First Peter 2 5. He said, And holy, a house of a holy priesthood. Yeah, he calls you priests. He calls you high priests in the scriptures. Uh, he calls you a pre in the priesthood. There are, the, listen, the priests had to be different than the rest of the people, amen. And we ought to be different than the rest of the people. People ought to be able to identify who we are, by not just what we say we are, but how we behave in what we are, amen. And I tell you, a change needs to take place in many people's lives. I'm convinced, I'm convinced that there's people, there's people that, that you'll, that somebody will go to visit or somebody will say, have you ever had this happen? Let me say this. You knocked on the door, visited somebody, and they say, I wouldn't go to that church because so-and-so goes there because of yada, 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 yada. Well, it's bad that they're making that judgment because they don't know what that believer got things right with God. Amen, pastor, amen. They don't know. But the thing is, the truth of the matter is, the world looks at you. The world examines you. The world examines this church. The world examines, Pastor Shot, Harvest Baptist Church. The, that's what the world's going to do. They're looking, they're, the world is looking for something different. They don't want something the same as they are. They want something different than what they are. Well, I tell you what, let's give, let's give them something different, amen? Let's give them what Christians ought to be. Live like Christians ought to live. Do what Christians ought to do as a child of God. We ought to be different as born-again believers saved by His wonderful grace. Not only do we see a changed life, but I wrote down in my notes, I believe that we ought to see a, a convicted life. A convicting life. There ought to be some conviction in your life about some things. I'm not saying that maybe, uh, uh, maybe I, I've got some convictions. I would say maybe that maybe you don't have about some things. That's fine. That's what I'm talking about. I'm talking about there ought to be some conviction uh, in your life about some things going on around you that you're not going to partake of, that you're not going to do, that you made a mind, your mind up by the grace of God, I will never do that, or by the grace of God, I'll never go in that direction, amen. Never say never because that very well might happen, but by the grace of God, I'm not going to do it, amen. By God's grace, I hope to keep on straight and narrow and doing the same thing I've done for many years, and that's where you ought to be as a child of God, not because I'm there, that's my conviction, but maybe it ought to be a conviction of something like that of you as a child of God. I'm not talking about clothing. I'm not talking about anything else, Pastor. I'm talking about there ought to be some born-again believer conviction in a child of God's life that there are some things they're just not going to do because they want to be a testimony to those who are around them. I was telling you the other night, excuse me, I got a sip of water. Anybody else want to sip? <clears throat> My mouth gets so dry anymore. I, well, I almost took a sip out of here, but, you know, I'm just not sure. You know. Yeah, amen. <laughs> Pastor Shot, see this? He, he has me a glass of ice water up here. Just saying, brother, just letting you know, amen. <laughs> love you, brother. Love you, amen. But I preach for you every year, and I don't get a glass of water on the pulpit. I'm just saying. <laughs> a convicted life. Look at Second Corinthians. <laughs> Look at I gotta get back to preaching, amen. <laughs> I rabbit trail. I don't rabbit trail anymore. I chase bunnies all over the place, amen. <laughs> Look at me at the, the Rome, uh, at Second Corinthians chapter seven. I want to read a couple of verses to you. Beginning verse eight. Paul Paul wrote his first letter to Corinth. Boy, he was rough on him in First Corinthians, amen. That he's pretty rough some places in Second Corinthians, but in First Corinthians, Paul told him a, a few things. And he comes to uh, verse eight of chapter seven here in Second Corinthians. He said, "For though I made you sorry with a letter, I do not repent, though I did repent. 
Some people say that's confusing. No, uh, Paul didn't repent over what he wrote them, Pastor. Paul, Paul did not want to hurt them, but Paul was honest with the word of God to them. He said, I didn't, I didn't, I'm, I'm not repenting because of what I wrote. I, I don't want to hurt you. He didn't want to hurt the believer. He didn't want to hurt the child of God. He didn't want to hurt the church. But Paul had to be honest with them and tell them some things that were gonna that were gonna make them feel bad. Amen. And so he goes on to say, For I perceive that the same epistle hath made you sorry. Though it were but for a season, not that they weren't so sorry, but they were heavy-hearted for a while. You ever been heavy-hearted for just a little bit, amen? But it still bothered you later on, but you weren't as heavy-hearted tomorrow as what you were today? That's what Paul's dealing with here. He said, now I rejoice not that ye were made sorry, but that ye sorrowed to, what? Repentance. For ye were made sorry after a godly manner, uh, that ye might receive damage by us in nothing. For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world worketh death. When is the world world sorry about anything? Let me tell you about the sorrow of the world. When when, When you're caught in the world, you're sorry because you were caught, not because of what you did. I was never sorry. Pastor, I was never sorry for anything I ever did or anybody I ever hurt until I came to Jesus Christ. Godly sorrow. Work with repentance. Amen? Amen? We need to get things right with God many times. You need to get things right with the Lord. You want, you want the right kind of relief? Get some conviction in your life about some things of God as a child of God and then begin to follow those things that you might do what's right. I, told, I think pastor at your church your night, Pastor Sada made a statement that there was a, even, even yet today, if I miss my road to a church and go down the road, I will not turn around in a bar parking lot. You say, what's wrong with that? Because I'm afraid that somebody from that church is going to see me pull out of there and then tell the preacher the next day because they saw me in church. You know where he was at the other night? Well, I was just turning around. Yeah, I proved you were just turning around. Amen? Uh, Listen, that's me. That might not be you. That's fine. I'm saying that's me. We need to have some conviction about some things in our lives, about some things we will do and don't do. And I don't think for me, I need to stand up here with a list of do's and don'ts and stand here and preach at you about do's and don'ts. Because listen, if you're a born again believer, saved by the grace of God, you know the do's and you know the don'ts. Amen? You know them. Oh, you say, no, I don't know, my, my, my friend. Then I would guess I'd have to question if you know Jesus. Amen. I really would. If you've been saved any length of time, been in the Bible any length of time, God has showed you some things that you just need to do as a child of God. You remember, you remember over there in Luke chapter 22? <laughs> you remember when Peter denied Christ and came under conviction? Amen. He says in the Lord turn, verse 61 to chapter 22, in the Lord turn when Peter denied him a third time. The Lord turned and looked upon Peter, and Peter remembered the word of the Lord and how he had said unto him before the cock crow, thou shalt deny me thrice. And the next very next verse says, Peter went out and what? Wept bitterly. Conviction. You say he wasn't filled with the Holy Spirit of God yet. The Holy Spirit was all over him that time. Conviction. Jesus looks at him. Conviction. Boy, you know what? When you get to the Word of God and Jesus searches your heart and Jesus looks at your heart and Jesus looks you eye to eye from the Word of God, there ought to be some conviction about sin, some conviction about some other things in your life that you need to get right and make right with God. It's just that simple. It can't be, Brother Mike. It is just that simple. I'm telling you. It, listen, it's not hard to get right with God. Amen. Brother Cedric, you hit the nail on the head. You hit the nail. I was in a missions conference one time preaching over in, over in, um, yeah, over in that area, over, over, over by Rochester, New York. And I was invited to preach for a week and did a Sunday to Sunday missions conference. Been there a couple of times over the years. And it came that Sunday, that Sunday night, the last night of the conference, the second Sunday. And I said, I want to do something different tonight. I said, I want to start off with prayer. I'm going to ask if you slip out of your seat right now and come to the altar and, and, and ask God 
to speak to your heart about missions giving through this message. Not speak to your heart about what I'm saying, but speak to your heart about missions giving. And the pastor wrote me in the next week, and he said, Brother Mike, our missions giving doubled this year. And it's not because of me, Pastor. I believe because God's people decided to get some things right with God. I'm convinced I'm an old, independent, fundamental, red, white, and blue neck Baptist. Amen. <laughs> and I believe, I believe that the altar call is important in the house of God. And people, I'm going to tell you what will happen. People will sit out there, and God speaks to their heart, and they will not get up, and they will not come forward, Pastor. It's, it's bad. It's not good. That's not good. And people will say, well, I can get things settled. Well, I want to tell you what, you can get things settled in your seat. You're absolutely right. But when you get up and you make a, you make a, uh, a firm stand and you go forward, you realize what people are going to be doing for you. They're going to be praying. Oh, I'm afraid what my wife's going to think or what my husband's going to think or what my kids are going to think or what my, 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 uh, my parents are going to think. Why are you worried about that? Why are we worried about that? Why not worry about our relationship between us and God? Let's worry about us between us and God. There ought to be some conviction in your life as a believer in Jesus Christ. He says it to the church in Laodicea, remember in chapter 3, verse 19, he says, Many as I love, I rebuke and chase and be zealous therefore, and what? Repent. Get that thing right with God, amen. Be the child of God that God has intended for you to be. A changed life and a convicted life. And then I believe that we will see over in 1 Peter with me, if you would, chapter 1. I believe we will see a consecrated life. We ought to have a consecrated life over in 1 Peter in chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1 with me, down to verse 16, the Bible makes this statement. In fact, verse 15, let's just back up to verse 15. But as he which hath called you is holy, so be holy in all manner of conversation, because it is written, be holy, for I am holy. That's what God says. Be holy for I am holy, he says. Now, there ought to be something, a semblance of holiness in your life as a child of God. Uh, you know, so many Christians today, so many born-again believers today live so much like the world, the only time you, you even know or think that they might be a Christian is when they're in the house of God. You know what's sad, uh, Pastor, uh, not far from you in Ohio and up in Michigan, I know of three churches in Michigan right now that were strong, fundamental, King James, independent Baptist churches that have now gone over the wrong way, and now they are allowing social drinking in their churches. Shame on them. Amen. Shame on them. Uh, not to be. That's not a consecrated life. That's a, life, that's a life of wickedness. Right. Why, would, why would anybody want to put themselves back under what drugged them down to start with? Amen. Right. Hey, listen. If, if there's such a thing as a bad day in salvation, if there is, amen? We've all had rough times, amen? But if, if there's such a day as a bad day, the worst day in salvation, yeah. then to me, is better than the best day I ever had before I was saved. Why would I want to go back? It's good now, amen. amen. I'm going to heaven, brother. If I drop over dead from a heart attack up here, that's fine. If I do, just let me go, amen. If I, if I happen, if I do, I'm in heaven. What? I ain't got to worry about it. The only thing better than this side of the grass is the other side of the grass. He says in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 9, he said, Who has saved us and called us with an holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. He says, with an holy calling. And, holy call. and that doesn't stop with him being holy. That stops it. He's called us with an holy calling. There ought to be some consecration in our lives as the children of God. There ought to be some holiness that would shine forth out of our lives as the children of God. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 10 says, For they verily, talking about our fathers, amen, for they verily for a few days chasten us after their own pleasure. That means that your parents disciplined you or you disciplined your children for 
of what you thought was right, the way you thought. Maybe you would discipline Titus different than what I disciplined my, my children for, Pastor, uh, uh, Brother Cedric. I was, a, uh, I was a syllable spanker. How many of you are syllable spankers? You know what I'm talking about? And I would add syllables in her. I told you never, ever to do anything like that ever again. Amen. Syllables banker. Amen. I don't know if you. Oh, Titus, is that you? Were you? You've been there. Huh? All right. Amen. <laughs> I'm just. I'm just simply saying. That's how we chased our kids to what we thought was right. Maybe you sent your kids to your room uh, for ten years, like I did, or I sent. You maybe you stood them in the corner and said, "Stay there until your nose rots to the wall." I don't know. Uh, what? How don't? But that's how we would discipline things like that. Maybe. Uh, but not God. Look what he goes on to say in that verse. He said, For they verily for a few days chasten us after their own pleasure, but he for our profit, that we might be partakers of his holiness. Are you a partaker of God's holiness? You know what, my friend? Uh, evidence of salvation is a changed life. Amen. Evidence of salvation is a convic convicted life. Evidence of salvation is a consecrated life and then I believe that I believe that a, a uh, convicted life and a consecrated life and a changed life will lead to something I wrote down in my notes I wrote this down a convincing life a convincing life when I um, what do you mean by that brother Mike when I first got saved I uh, uh in Jefferson, Ohio, where I grew up, not far from Grafton, an hour maybe from Grafton, an hour, and maybe around an hour and 15, 20 minutes or something like that, where I grew up. And, and uh, we had a police officer in town, in town by the name of Kenny Johnson. And Kenny and I hated each other with a passion. I would do anything I could to, to uh, irritate him, anything I could uh, to, I mean, I'm, I, anything I could. And he hated me. And when, when he busted me the last time, um, sometime second or third time, in there somewhere, amen, <laughs> uh, he got me on the steps to the town hall where, where the, um, uh, city, the city uh, police department was. And our county, the county was Ashtabula County. The county sheriff's department where the county jail was was just two blocks over. And Kenny, that night, Kenny, first time he ever did it, he handcuffed me in front of myself. He stood behind my back. I can't hardly get back there anymore, amen. <laughs> I don't want to get arrested again. That hurt, amen. <laughs> but he, he handcuffed me in front of myself. And then he reached down and he pulled his jacket sideways and he unsnapped his holster and he loosened up his he, 357. He had in his, in his holster there. And he looks at me and he says, Mike, he said, I'll give you, I'll give you a 50-yard head start. You know what that would have done? About five yards off that stoop and I'd been shot in the back of the head. And that was, he didn't like me. And I did not like him. I just sort of laughed at him. Now, what I wanted to say was, why don't you lay down that gun and take these handcuffs off and let's see who comes out on top. But he probably would have whooped me because he was an ex-Marine and I was just a punk, amen. amen. <laughs> he, would have, he would have hurt me big time, you know. And, uh, but, but I didn't let him know that. But I didn't say that to him. You know, he took me to jail. When I got saved about four years later or three years later, somewhere around that time after that happened, that incident, that incident he, um, I was in a ministry in Michigan at the time been saved about six years, five, six years. And I came back to Jefferson. I found out he became the chief of police in our town. Our chief of police resigned. So I heard that. So I thought, okay. So I got on the telephone. I called Kenny up on the telephone. And I said, Kenny, I said, um, I said this is Mike Patterson. He said, who? I said, Mike Patterson. said, really? Yeah. I said, yeah, really. I said, uh, I'd like to meet with you. You know, <laughs> I didn't tell him why, you know, I didn't tell him, I didn't tell him anything, but I said, I'd just like to meet with you. He said, okay, N true story, listen to this. He says, <laughs> I like this part because he says, he said, we got a brand new donut shop in town. <laughs> Eight o'clock tomorrow morning, amen. <laughs> <laughs> 
been sucking them down ever since. Amen. <laughs> so he says, uh, he says to me, he said, eight o'clock tomorrow morning donut shop. I said, okay. So I get in there. The mayor was in there, and he had to deal with the mayor about some things. So when he was done, he said, hey, let's let's just. Uh, I didn't say anything to him. Just talk to him for a little bit. He said, let's go for a ride. And I just looked at him and said, well, you can sit in the front seat. I said, good. First time ever, amen. And so he put me in the front seat of the cruiser. We're going, we're going through town. We're talking a little bit. And, and we get over to the police department. We pull in the parking lot. We're sitting there. I said, Kenny, I says, um, I asked to meet with you today. I said, because I want you to know something. And, uh, and I was starting to choke up because, you know, God convicted my heart, Pastor, when I got saved. That anybody I had hurt before I got saved... I need to make that right with them after I got saved. And I still practice that today if I run into somebody in my hometown. I'm never there, but if I ever run into them, I do that same thing today. And I said, Kenny, I said, I want you to know something. I said, when I was in jail prison this last time in, in uh, Chillicothe is where I was at, at the time, I said, um, uh, I said, I got down on my knees uh, in my prison cell, and I said, I prayed. And I asked Jesus Christ to come into my heart and forgive me for my sin. And I said, Kenny, I got so I'm not the same. I said, I'm a born again believer. I'm saved by the grace of God. And I'm sorry for the way I treated you when I was growing up. And I want to ask you if you please forgive me. And now I'm starting to weep as I'm talking to him, you know. And he sits there in his cruiser and he looks over at me and I see tears coming down his eyes. And he says to me this, he says, Mike, he says, I got saved last year over here at the Nazarene church. And he said, I'm sorry for how I treated you. Would you please forgive me? And a great friendship developed between him and I. There should be something different. Amen. Amen in a changed life, in a consecrated life, in a convicted life, I believe will, 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 I believe for you and I will lead, will lead us to a convincing life. A life that will convince others of what has happened to us in our lives. There should be a difference, amen. Am I right about that? He said, but ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and a holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. He said in Philippians 2.15, uh, that ye may be blameless and harmless as sons of God without rebuke. Listen to that. That's an important word. Not without, but rebuke. Amen. <laughs> but without rebuke. Without rebuke. In the midst of a crooked and perverse nation among whom ye shine as lights in the world. There should be a difference in our lives as the children of God. And a changed life, a life that has been changed, and a life that is convicted, and a life that is consecrated, is a life that will be convincing to those who are around us. They don't understand what happened to you. I had people after people after people after I got saved, Pastor, offer me drugs and offer me alcohol. Could not understand. Some of my best friends could not understand what happened to Mike Patterson. Did not want to believe that I got saved. One of my best friends said, tell me it's not real. Tell me, you really didn't do that. You only did it to get out of prison. No, it is real. Amen. amen. It ought to be real in your life. Yes. Amen. Ought to be real. Yes. Ought to be real. He says in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 8 through 10, let me read this and we'll be done. For ye were sometimes darkness. I like that, I like that word in there, were. I don't know anything about the English language, brother. I butcher it. I don't even try to understand Greek or Hebrew. I have a hard enough time understanding this and that, amen. <laughs> but that word were is past tense. And he says, for ye were sometimes darkness. Amen. There's some of those things some of us did that were darkness, amen. <laughs> but he says, but now are ye light in the Lord. A change. Walk as children of light, for the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth, proving what is acceptable unto the Lord. Boy, is your life acceptable unto the Lord? Is it proving? Is it proving out in your life as a child of God? You ought to have a convincing life. 
but it's not going to happen if it's not been changed. Let's have our heads bowed and our eyes closed.